Welcome everybody to our event today on lives, livelihoods and lockdowns, debating COVID-19 policy trade-offs. So the event today is part of the LSE's public event series in shaping the post-COVID world. And as we know, uh, the policy responses to COVID-19 have involved quite severe restrictions on the contact we've had to have, we've been able to have with other people. And by and large, these restrictions have been imposed on everybody, irrespective of their risks from the virus. And some people consider this to be the most effective way to deal with the impact of the virus, while others have argued that our policy responses ought to be targeted at those who are most at risk of morbidity and mortality. So my panel today is going to seek to debate these issues, to flush out some of the costs and benefits of these and other possible approaches. And I'm delighted to welcome a fantastic panel uh, to help us talk through these issues today. We have Professor Dame Sally Davis, who is Master of Trinity College, University of Cambridge and Special Envoy on Antimicrobial Resistance for the UK Government. Professor Paul Dolan, Professor of Behavioural Science at the London School of Economics. Professor Shinitra Gupta, who's Professor of Theoretical Epidemiology at the University of Oxford. Professor Carl Hennigan, who's a Clinical Epidemiologist and Professor of Evidence-Based Medicine, also at the University of Oxford and Professor David Hunter, Richard Dole Professor of Epidemiology and Medicine and Director of the Translational Epidemiology Unit at the Nuffield Department of Population Health, University of Oxford. So thank you all for joining us today. And for those of you who are attending, thank you very much for attending as well. And if you would like to ask questions, then please use the, um, the Q&A function. So our order of speakers, I will ask each of our speakers to address some of these issues to um, in turn. And then what we will do, we will certainly open up the discussion for, uh, for Q&A and hoping to allow plenty of time because I realize this is quite a, a key issue which a lot of us have been debating and concerned about. I wonder if Sally, if I could turn to you first to, to ask why don't you, one of the issues has been, you know, how quickly should one introduce a lockdown? And obviously different countries have had different responses. Given your experiences and your own reflections, why did we have this differential approach as to how quickly governments should go into lockdown and how hard those lockdowns should be? Thank you. I think this is going to be a really interesting discussion and I'm looking forward to it though I must say because I've got camera problems having been in front of the select committee this morning I'm looking skew with. But anyway, I, I thought it'd be interesting to start by reflecting on the fact that three of the best performing countries, Germany, Finland and New Zealand, have in common women leaders. So how come that they moved to suppression or lockdown early? Was it the science? Was it political compromise? Or was it their leadership style? I would posit that the charismatic leadership role is not playing well for in modern day times and particularly in this emergency. So what was going on? Um, having been the chief medical officer, I don't think it's for me to say, but I do think it's a mix of things. We prepared for flu and we had a kind of scientific group think that if we got a big pandemic, it would be flu, but it wasn't. It's coronavirus this time. Flu will come, we'll get more pandemics of flu for sure. We didn't look to Asia to learn. Is that British exceptionalism? Is it, uh, is it some other reason? Yet they'd had SARS and the Middle East had had MERS, so they had things to learn from. In fact, I had a, a quite difficult, though, I found sweet conversation with an African who said to me, you know, Sally, we used to think the rule book for how to do these things came from you and the States, and now it doesn't. And I said, no, we should be humble enough to learn that the rule book comes from Asia on this. Another issue is the NHS, our national religion. So we prioritized actually saving the NHS for a, for a long time as our first priority. Our second priority was clearly saving lives. 
at any cost? I think one of the most interesting things I've actually seen about that came from a former chief economist in the Department of Health, Barry McCormick, who, and I got the figures, but actually essentially pointed out that the policies being followed to save these lives would fail the net benefit test of what we pay to save lives through cancer treatments or screening or immunizations or anything. It was a benefit of 270,000 per life saved. Um, and you know, two weeks of lockdown would cost more than three times the benefit. So we prioritize the NHS, we prioritize saving lives. Where was the balance uh, happening about well-being and mental health and the economy? And I think we're going to go forward looking at that sort of issue. And then when uh, the uh, coronavirus hit our NHS, what we see is what everyone knows and accepts. Year after year, the NHS across the whole of the UK runs hot in January and February because of flu, seasonal flu, or has problems because of snow. So we know we've got no resilience in there. And if you look at the number of doctors per population head, uh, hospital beds or ITU beds in Europe, German is at the top and we're in the bottom six. For all of those things, we didn't have resilience. So you can prepare as much as you want, but if you have no resilience, it's going to be very difficult. I suppose the final thing that I'd um, say in these introductory remarks is of course um, the politics. In the end, the prioritization, the decisions are political. Scientists can only advise where they're getting the economics, the well-being, the social cohesion, all of that, it's still advice. And they have to weigh up the advice and how hard the evidence is. And we know as we've been going through, this evidence has been developing and it wasn't hard at the beginning. I still think that back in the early summer, we should have had a strong mask mandate. So does the president of the Royal Society. He came out loud and clear and we still haven't got a strong mask mandate. But that decision for all of that, based on the advice has to be balanced with the politics, with the votes, with the non-experts, with the cries to protect our grannies, with the libertarians. And those are difficult decisions. And we now see where they've fallen and how it's played out. Thank you. Sally, thank you for that. And I think that's framed the debate beautifully, actually, just brilliantly for us. And uh, you started to talk about some of those important trade-offs when talking about different policy options, so it's well-being, the economy, social cohesion, obviously isolation, mental well, well mental well-being. So David, um, I wonder if I could turn to you to just help us really identify what some of those important trade-offs are when deciding between these different policy options, suppression, mitigation, et cetera. David. Sure, so thanks. Oh, I think I've lost David temporarily. He's frozen. Or if we intervene a couple of weeks earlier. There we go. And so we've plumped for mitigation rather than suppression. Uh, as Sally said, this was COVID, not flu. And the dogma was that you couldn't really maximally suppress flu. It had to sort of pass through the population. That was a good thing in the long run in terms of annual waves of flu. But it meant that we uh, reacted late. And so we had a much worse first wave than we might otherwise have had with the wisdom of hindsight. And so lockdown was the answer. And really to understand why lockdown had to be the answer, uh, we just need to know two characteristics of the virus. It's contagious enough that it will spread rapidly through any uh, population, but it's not so contagious that you can't control it. But to control it, you need uh, something fairly close to a hard lockdown, uh, tier three, not tier one. We've seen that play out again in the last month. 
The second characteristic is that it's lethal enough to fill ICUs at the point where only a few percent of the population have been exposed. But it's not so lethal that any government could claim that they've been legitimately overwhelmed and there was nothing they could do, they were powerless. So as far as I can see, the aim of, or the driver of government policy was to prevent a Lombardy style situation where doctors in ICUs were obliged to ration care, ration ventilators, ration admission to the ICUs, where patients were lining up on gurneys, unable to get a bed, uh, to prevent the situation that happened in many New York City hospitals, where refrigerated vans were running outside the hospitals with bodies stacked in them. And that was just something that the politicians could not see happening in the UK. So uh, lockdown, the phrase protect the NHS was just brilliant uh, in terms of risk communication, but it really should have been prevent ICUs overflowing. And as uh, Sally said, when you've got a quarter of the ICU beds per 100,000 population that Germany has and some of the other European countries have, uh, you're gonna reach that point much faster. The slogan protect the NHS, unfortunately, is really a misnomer. Uh, as we all know, the NHS was not protected. Uh, the staff wasn't protected, PPE, etc. Uh, burnout over a long period of uh, overwork. There's been an 80-fold increase in patients who are waiting more than 12 months for some sort of treatment. The number of people, the proportion of people getting their cancer chemotherapy or cancer treatment within two months has fallen from 86%. Uh, July last year to 25% July this year. So the NHS wasn't protected. It was really uh, shunted into being a COVID service. And this was, again, to um, protect against the idea that people of any age, but of course we know it affects uh, uh, much greater people of older age, that people were dying because they couldn't get treatment that could be offered. So lost in all this, obviously, uh, but also moot, if that's your calculus, is the idea of the collateral economic damage. Um, and the fact is, the unfortunate fact is that the untreated illnesses will be theoretical calculations that won't be front page headlines, won't be god awful pictures uh, in newspapers, which could have resulted if the ICUs had been overwhelmed. One possible benefit, this wasn't part of the calculus. We still don't know really what the impact of long COVID is going to be. And if that's as bad as some people say it's going to be, then at least this policy um, prevented a lot of people getting infected and prevented a lot of long COVID damage, which at the end of the day, we'll have to see how that trades off against all of the other damage that has been done. So I think the bottom line is that if you're a country with less hospital beds, less ICU beds than other countries, if your policy aim is to not have pictures of military trucks pulling outside hospitals to take away coffins, then uh, lockdown is inevitable. Um, we can talk again whether we could have avoided uh, a second lockdown. I think we could have if we'd worked harder over the summer but of course we didn't because the moment the ICUs weren't threatened, the brakes came off. Uh, there was the Dominic Cummings fiasco. Uh, we were all encouraged to go on vacations in July and August. Uh, the politicians didn't react in time in September when they were advised to do a circuit breaker. And all of that again was because the uh, near and present danger of hospitals being overwhelmed was not right in front of them, so they reacted too slowly. And so we've got a second wave. My guess is, um, you know, if we relax at Christmas, we'll have a third wave in January and February before the virus kicks in. And all of this is just the short-term political response uh, that's too slow uh, for the first wave, way too slow for the second wave, because what they're really reacting to are the not the projections, but the actual number of people in hospital beds and 
um, are there uh, images of people being turned away. So with that, I'll uh, pass it back. Thanks, David. I think that's, you know, some interesting observations there as well about, about as, as Sally was bringing out in terms of political, kind of what the political drivers uh, for some of these decisions. And Shanitra, if I could turn to you, one of the issues has, uh, of debate has been, you know, um, a differentiation of response. And we've got a, a debate that goes on right now around differentiation on the basis of geography. You know, should we have a more granular response to our tiering uh, policy that's come into the into England um, and into the devolved nations in different ways, or should we be thinking about a differentiated response in a different way? And one of the things I know you've been uh, advocating is is a differentiated approach to to shielding. Um, and I was wondering what your thoughts on why governments haven't taken shielding more seriously uh, for the vulnerable and thus allowing younger people to still move about more freely. Um, so if you could, it would be really helpful to hear your, your thoughts on, on having a differentiated policy in relation to vulnerability, I suppose. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. I'm going to, um, I will address that as, as uh, concisely and um, well, clearly, hopefully as possible um, uh, with, with the help of some slides. So I'm just going to share my screen now. Um, there we go. Right. OK, so I'm going to gallop through these, so not, not going to any of the details, which have been very kindly, in any case, provided uh, for by the previous uh, Sally and David. Um, so uh, the, my starting point always has been actually right from March is that my suspicion was, and I think it's becoming more and more clear, we cannot afford lockdowns. I mean, uh, several um, less developed countries came to that conclusion a long time ago. Uh, I think it's also true for the UK. We have to sit up and smell the coffee. We cannot afford, and by afford, I obviously do not just mean uh, that we don't have enough money in our coffers. I mean that the effects of lockdown are, the harms are profound and, and simply, I don't think they're an option. So then the question is, what is an option? Is there, what do we do then? Um, and what we uh, proposed with the Great Barrington Declaration and various other, uh, on various other platforms was what we called focus protection. And uh, what we were doing was actually asking a question because, you know, what else can one do as scientists? Uh, and the workable solution contained this, basically that we shelter the vulnerable and this is afforded you know, by the characteristic of the virus that it does at, um, cause deaths in a very specific category of, of people. So we can define the vulnerable, um, but allow immunity to accumulate. Um, of course, it has to be monitored on a fine scale to see where we're at. Um, this is still um, included investing in therapy, particularly vaccination as a means of protecting the vulnerable in particular. And it seemed to me right at the outset that it was important to think outside national boundaries. So all this business of, okay, we're gonna close our borders and not let the virus in just seemed to me absolutely retrograde and, and derelict of our international responsibilities. So this was what, uh, for me anyway, was a sort of blueprint for moving forwards. Now, what is this all based on? It's ba how can this be a workable solution in the first place? Well, all of this thinking is based around the central idea and accepted by almost all modelers of how this pathogen behaves. So you can either use a very simple compartmental model, like this SIR model I've shown you, or a, com a complicated compu computer model, as many people are using. But effectively, what these models um, recognize and accept is that this, kind, this is a sort of this is an epidemic which involves the a decimation of a susceptible population, growth of people who are recovered and at least for a temporarily immune and that the infection as such, um, that the epidemic itself will rise and peak and, and drop off, stabilize for the time being anyway, over um, a short period of 12 weeks or maybe let's say six months on the outside. And this is the sort of thing we have seen in parts of the world where lockdown hasn't 
um, you know, they haven't been able to lock down to, to the extent um, of suppressing the virus. And the, 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 the patterns that we see in these parts of the world are very much in line with this kind of SIR type dynamic. Uh, suggesting that herd immunity, that is the accumulation of immunity in the population, does play an important role or can play an important role in bringing down the infections to a level where the risk is low. It doesn't eliminate it. The idea that you can get rid of something like COVID, I think, is one that people have abandoned, so I won't go there. So what? It, why to go have people not um, said, oh, that sounds brilliant, why don't we just shield the vulnerable over that period of danger um, that is, you know, it's a win-win. We protect their lives, their livelihoods, their jobs, everything is fine. And then for the period that people have to be sheltered, that's temporary. We, we've obviously already done something similar to that. Why don't we just do that? And then we'll be back to normal quickly. So there have been all sorts of objections. First of which was that, um, that there might not be any natural immunity to COVID. Well, that's just not true. So I'm just going to skip over that line, uh, slide. There is um, naturally acquired immunity to SARS-CoV-2, as you'd expect, given um, how we respond to other coronaviruses. And then there's this fundamental misconception that sort of seems to have be pervasive, which is that what if immunity doesn't last forever? What, what happens then? And the truth is COVID is not measles. And one of the problems I think with the modeling is that people are still very anchored to either thinking of it as flu or measles. And those are the two sort of paradigms that are in people's heads. COVID belongs to a large category of respiratory infections and other sorts of infections where immunity isn't lifelong and you do get repeated reinfections. Um, but these reinfections do not carry with them a huge likelihood of, of severe disease and death. Does that mean, though, if immunity doesn't last forever, that herd immunity is not possible? This is a quote from a Nature review recently, which says, if people who are infected become susceptible in a year, then we'll never reach herd immunity through natural transmission. And that is simply not true. Here are some simulations which show, I can't go into the detail, but it is perfectly possible for immunity to be maintained at a level that keeps risk low, um, even when, if it is lost yearly and people have to are reinfected to, to maintain that immunity. It's a bit like a cistern where the level can remain um, at a, you, you can have the level of water remaining high or remaining full, um, even if the flow out of it is quite high, provided the flow back in is low. And in this case, the flow back in through reinfection doesn't carry costs of um, death and disease. And this mirrors what happens with other coronaviruses. And essentially what this suggests is our destination here should be what the other coronaviruses do, because we know we live with them, we accept the deaths that they cause, and, and we are able to, we have a strategy already dealing with them. In addition, it's possible that the cistern, when it, um, the epidemic started, wasn't actually completely empty. It might have been partially full because we do have cross immunity, at least cross reactive responses with other, the other coronaviruses. And there's plenty of indication that these might be protective, in which case the sort of threshold of herd immunity that's of infection that's required to bring things down is very much lower than we currently perceive. So all of this, of course, is somewhat. So then the question is, okay, so given all these uncertainties, um, you know, what do we do? Where are we then with this epidemic? How much herd immunity do we have? And this again is a question that um, is difficult to answer from the data that we have alone. But back in March, we showed that anything, various scenarios fit the data that we had at the time, including one where the epidemic would have taken off much earlier and already spread through the population. And there are some studies emerging now which suggest that indeed, and as you would might expect for a disease that is so, so contagious, that it might well have spread substantially before the time that we started detecting or the deaths started to amass. 
anyway, um, how do we know, what, so what do we do here? How do we tell where we're at? How do we know how many people have already been infected? Well, in March, I had hoped very much that we could use serological methods to resolve that issue. And we set about um, developing these. Craig Thompson in our research group had a test running by the end of March to look for neutralizing antibodies. Um, unfortunately, we weren't able to get the right samples to, to uh, conduct that, but we did do it in, in Scotland and found quite low levels of antibody there. Um, but unfortunately for this disease, uh, for our immune response to SARS, um, antibodies, which are only part of one's immune response, um, it, levels in the blood tend to decay very quickly. So they turn, antibodies turn out not to be a good marker for this. So this other assertion that keeps being made that, oh, we're not immune, nobody's immune, seroprevalence levels are low, is, is, not, is not based on, um, there are various reasons to say that there, there is no certainty in that. So then the final question is, well, all right, well, let's say all of that does work then. How can you possibly shield, shelter the vulnerable? And um, this is something Carl can speak to better, but infection control and care holes and hospitals seems to be a major part of that um, activity. And surely, you know, that's something that is almost embedded anyway in what we're doing. And then social distancing in, within the community that is commensurate with risk has been dismissed on the grounds that um, it's impossible to separate people um, at risk elderly people, for example, from the general population. And the truth is that only a very small proportion of people live in situations where they are um, in, con in re or in households where there are people over the age of 65, a, a, a tiny proportion of the working population. So what that needs, what we need there is a better understanding of what is um, the real scenario and protecting these people, the people who don't live with um, in, in situations where they might be in contact with the younger parts of the population is something that we're doing anyway through lockdown. Um, for the rest of the population, we would have to think of more creative solutions like evacuating them. So in the end, basically, our, I think where we are all coming from, those of us who uh, advocate shielding is this is that lockdown really hurt the working classes, mostly amongst other things. And we'd like to um, propose that we move forward in um, tackling this by looking at this in a much more holistic way. Um, and I, I won't bore you with my Aristotelian triangle here. We can talk about it later, about how we integrate, how we think about this whole problem both in terms of the mechanics of it and what the socioeconomic costs are and indeed the ethos that we wished to, um, that, that we uh, have agreed upon through social contract as underlying these decisions. Okay, I'll, I'll end there. Sorry, but overrunning. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, and I think it's so the, I mean, I think the, some of the issues that you brought up there, um, you know, lead us quite well into my my next question, really, to Carl, which is around around the use of data. Um, and we've had a few comments already about the kind of both the use of data and the interpretation of data. So Sally started off saying, you know, looking at the same data, um, you know, our government and, and other Western governments, I suppose, um, looked at the data and thought, well, it's, it looks like flu, we'll prepare for flu. Um, so one, one psychologist described this to me as the, the duck rabbit problem. You know, you look at an image and some people will see a duck, some will see a rabbit. Um, we've had a point from David about, you know, the visibility, as it were, of the R number, but the lack of visibility about deaths that may be arising from uh, non-care or postponed care. Uh, Shanit's talking about evolving data, about, uh, and Sally referenced, you know, as, as, as things become more certain, uncertain. So how were, what have been the main lessons that we've learned for how data can can be used to inform policy trade-offs in a pandemic. I mean, we're not through this yet, so we've still got to pick up those lessons, learn them and deploy them 
almost simultaneously. What do you think are the main things that we've learned about the use of data? Thanks. Um, what I might do, if you don't mind, um, is I might, might actually show you some uh, slides as well myself, if that's all right. If you just bear with me a second. I'm just going to share my screen, if that's feasible. Uh-huh, absolutely. Now, how does that feel? You can see my screen, can you? Yep, can indeed. Now, I think, I think there are a couple of things I'd say first is there are lots of uncertainties in terms of what I know, what we try to discover in terms of going forward. But the, the main thing is, I think we're all trying to get to the same point. We're trying to maintain the health and well-being of the population while trying to minimize this societal disruption. And how we get there is important. And there are differences in the approach. But what I want to do is just take you through some of the things I look at all the time and think about. So this is a graph of patients in hospital that you can see. And you can see on the left-hand side here, you've got the uh, first wave and then you've got the second wave here on the right hand side. And it's been concerning to people that actually this right hand side, it matches the first hand side. So maybe we've done just as bad this time and we're gonna be overwhelmed. Well, first thing is to think there are some differences this time around. Um, we have had less deaths. So that means the number in hospital is greater. Second, we haven't discharged people into care homes like we did in the first wave. So people are in hospital longer. And third is we have actually admitted more people this time round, whereas last time round, as a general practitioner myself at the weekends, we virtually shut down healthcare services. But it's interesting when you look at think about this data, what I'm going to do now is just move on to the next slide which is this is the data in the second wave is much more usable in a format. There's much better data this time around than in the first wave. Remember, we weren't testing anybody. We're only testing people in hospital. So there are lots of uncertainty. But this graph shows the admissions from the community. And this is available on NHS England and you can do some maths and you can come out with data. But what it shows is the good news is community admissions are starting to come down. They peaked up here about 11, 1200. In fact, today they're below a thousand. So we're going in the right direction. But the blue line is healthcare associated infections. That's basically, and as you can see, they get up here into about 250. So healthcare associated infections are 20% of those in hospital ad beds. So when we talk about focus measures to, to sort issues out, one in five of people with COVID in hospital catch it while they're an inpatient. They stay longer, their morbidity is worse, their mortality is worse. So this is a infrastructure problem that we have issues with now. And I think we could go back to the Germany issue just to say we run a service that, that we say runs at 95% all the time. The UK has about 246 beds per 100,000 population. Germany has 800 beds per 100,000 population. So while Germany has just over a million infections, we have 1.6 million, million cases. But they have 17,000 deaths, whereas we have 59,000 deaths from COVID. The question is, is there a structure in the NHS? And I know they have much more community hospitals. They have the ability to separate people much more. If you reduce the hospital acquired infections, you can make a big impact on this disease. The other line here is actually care home admissions, which have continued to go up and they form about 10% of all admissions from care homes. So there's 30% of the population in beds are healthcare associated infections or care homes. Now care homes are an incredibly important part of this story. This graph is the care home outbreaks and they changed in terms of who reported the data. Early on, this came from the government, then Public Health England took over the data. But this is the first wave of infections. Now, if you remember, we went into lockdown here. Lockdown does not have an effect in terms of care home outbreaks, because if you look what happened is, they went upwards into lockdown. Quite considerably, three weeks into a lockdown, we still reported a thousand care home outbreaks. In the first wave, there was 5,000, just over 5,000, a third of care homes had outbreaks. 
and that accounts for 40 percent of the deaths. So you start to answer questions that whatever you do in your lockdown measure, it doesn't help with this. Now, simple things went badly wrong. We know discharging patients into care homes with active infection. But having locum agency staff that move between care homes triples your rates of infection. Oxfordshire, where we have a problem with this, had 80% of care homes had outbreaks in, in our county. A huge problem that creates a huge burden. And again, here on the right hand side, you can see, although things are better, we still haven't sorted the problem because we're looking at over 2000 care home outbreaks. So when we look at the Far East, we should be looking at particular issues like care homes. Hong Kong has a very clear policy. They had three months of supply. They have infection control training. And what they do is you have an eight week period where you've got a problem. In that eight week, you define a measure where you go, you're gonna protect the care homes. You could have that position where you reduce the number of people coming and going. You have testing, you have testing of staff. And as I put for policy, you need a 20% oversupply of staff to deal with the isolation going off sick. So you don't end up with people moving between homes. Now, here's another slide. This is something I'm working on right now. And I think this is interesting. When we look at policies, we assume across the country, somehow we can have policies and it'll affect everywhere equally. Like if you look at Lombardy, it's completely different to the south of, of Italy, where you wouldn't even know they'd have a problem. Now, this blue line is an interesting line. This is Liverpool. Now, interestingly, on the 4th of October, Liverpool reached a case rate of 400 per 100,000. That's what we define an epidemic as in primary care. At that point, we say, and Sally will come in on this possibly because she will remember sending us a letter as CMO saying we're at the epidemic levels. It is now time to think about the issues in terms of the NHS will become overwhelmed. Now look what happened in Liverpool. In fact, it took another 10 days by the time they get to 700 per 100,000 for restrictions to come into place. And actually, Peak bed occupancy occurred at 31%. Now, the interesting issue is, if you have policy that's very inflexible, slow to act, you can't respond to something that's happening very quickly. And actually, we're trying to create objective criteria for understanding when will your NHS be overwhelmed. And actually, it's, it is the 400 per 100,000 should be the tier three restriction area, because that's the point at which you're going to get to about a third of your beds being occupied. But what you can't do is announce policy and think about it for a week. And by the time you get there, you're up at seven, eight hundred per 100,000. So it's the same as going in. In fact, what we need is policy that's highly flexible and reacts today. You are at the level where the criteria is you're being overwhelmed. Similarly, it should tell you when to come out very quickly. And if we look at the policy today, it's based on data two weeks ago. That's what the problem many of the MPs were having yesterday, is their data looked radically different. But I also want you to look at the yellow dotted line here. If you look at this yellow dotted line, this is Oldham. Oldham has in the trust one of the highest levels of trust occupancy, about 25%. But if you remember, Oldham's restricting restrictions started in the beginning of July. They're now going into their fourth month, fifth month of restrictions. The fatigue must be huge in an area like this. And this is the interesting issue about seasonal pathogens. The environment's right. It doesn't matter what you do. You're going to get to a peak and then it's going to come off. And that peak is very different to somewhere down here, like in Devon, where actually it's one eighth the case rate in Devon a radically different area environment that makes a huge difference. So we have to think about the structure of our urban centers where this is a big problem. This one here is Nottingham, which in universities is really interesting. Most people will represent the significant impact that happened in university cities. The question is, to what extent does this younger age group affect the older age group and can you actually change that in some way, that issue? And that's a really interesting question because what you tend to do when you're locked down is you flatten the curve in terms of younger people. And actually the question is, how do you stop that, date, that transmission into the elderly? Now I'm just gonna move on. Just some interesting, excess deaths, incredibly interesting. 
and we'll learn a lot. This is a report from PHE. It's called a fingertips report. It comes out weekly, and this is the excess deaths in England. Here's the left-hand side. Huge amounts of deaths, excess, 11,000 at the peak. We've never seen anything like that. But here at this side is much more what we wouldn't recognise does happen on some years when you have a bad flu season. But it would generally happen December, January, February. So we're early on now. But context matters because what we know with excess is the average will now rise into December and into January. That's what normally happens. And I'll come back to that point. But there are a couple of caveats about this data, which is very interesting. The place of death, and this is something that just interests me but concerns me, is that deaths in the own home have actually been 27,000 excess deaths. And 95% of them are not COVID. In care homes, there's been 23,000 excess deaths, about 67% of COVID. But in hospitals, there's only been about 10,000 excess deaths. So while the majority, about 38,000 COVID deaths have occurred in hospital, there's only 10,000 excess. And there are probably two reasons for this. One is, are people choosing to die at home more often? And I think there is some anecdotal evidence that's occurring because what people say is if you go into hospital, your relatives can't come. So we want to have a diet. We want to die at home and we want that to be managed in the home setting so we can be there. So that's a resource issue because you can see this is a considerable number of excess deaths each week in the home setting occurring. But the second is to what extent is this preventable death? This is the problem of people not coming forward with ischemic heart disease, with diabetes, with stroke, with TIAs. And stroke's a very good example because when somebody has a stroke, if, if they live alone, is they have a problem because 95% of people with a stroke, it will be another person who informs the health service or the emergency services that they have a stroke. So if we go into lockdown and you live alone, you have a problem if you have a complication. And here's what it looks like just for the, for the hospitals to see a radically different picture and actually through the summer, far fewer deaths in hospitals. Now, I just, I just wanted to finish with a couple of points just to point out. One of the reasons we are now having a problem is because we've said we face our worst bed crisis. And that's what we're going into. And this is a talk I do all the time. But what I do at this point is, is explain this was 2000 when I was a junior doctor and we were spending 37 billion on the NHS. In, in the last 20 years, we've nearly quadrupled the spending in the NHS. But each year we keep coming back to this problem. That's a recurring problem. It doesn't matter where you are. There's Andy Burnham in 2015. NHS conditions, worst ever. We have a structural problem within the NHS that occurs year on year. And we do not seem to be able to flex to somehow provide about 25% extra beds in a setting that's required that reduces the burden of healthcare associated infections. So I'm going to finish here, and I just this is data from RCGP surveillance. This is a weekly return on symptomatic consultations in primary care from about 5 million practices, and it's been going for 60 years. And I just wanted to show you just to think of the data. What does, what does our year look like in respiratory infections? The black line is a sum of all of respiratory infections. And over here, this is December, just coming up from... November. So this is where we are now. Going into December, drops down a bit at Christmas, and we come back into January. And that's influenza last year and a combination of RSV. The yellow line here is, is acute respiratory infection. The purple line is, you think of that, a pneumonia. And then the red line is obviously COVID. Now there's a, an issue here of testing capacity that under represents it. So this is a line of possible and that's where, but the first thing to note is that the seasonal effect shows this was dropping in the first week in March. And that actually some of the drop we saw, actually about 50% of the drop that we observed came somewhere before lockdown occur. That's as we change our behavior. In the weeks before, people started to work at home more. 
and actually did change certain aspects. But this has been interesting. This is through summer. And actually through summer, we have rates at about 100 per 100,000. But often we go through summer not noticing that respiratory pathogens are circulating, but they have much less of an impact. We are outside, we're ventilated, our immune systems are better somehow. But what we've learned with all this extra testing is that actually these pathogens do circulate at a low level in temperate environments. So we've got to think differently when we could do comparisons with those countries that don't have such a dramatic seasonal effect. The yellow line here, this is schools going back. This is rhinovirus, adenovirus, schools going back. Here's the red line with universities going back. And in fact, if we sum all of this together, we are where we normally are within the confines of what we'd expect to see in terms of a respiratory consultation. The question is, just like other countries, if you accept that's what's gonna happen, like I showed in Oldham, how do you minimize the impact? Because the one difference about coronavirus, which I'd say to flu, when we have flu seasons, we have much higher admissions in younger children under fives. In fact, we have significant number of deaths in under ones with flu and RSV. Coronavirus doesn't do that, but the profile of risk with age is huge with coronavirus. Seems to be by the time you get to 80, it is so deleterious that you have a huge problem. 75% of the deaths come in over 75s, 40% of the problem is in care homes and 20% is hospital acquired infection. If you put that all together, you start to think, hmm, is there a different approach that we need to put together now, not just now, but medium and long term? Thank you very much. Great, thank you, Carl. And Paul, that leads us well, I think, into, um, into you and, and reflections on the trade-off and whether there really is a trade-off between lives and livelihoods in terms of how we respond, um, particularly thinking about how we respond, perhaps how we respond today, but also how we respond going forward, given that it looks as if we will have to be learned a way to, to live with COVID uh, in different ways. So, there, so is there a trade-off between lives and livelihoods? Yeah, thank you, Julia. Um the short answer to that question is it's really hard to know um and i think that that then makes it doubly important that we try to find out and particularly that we have diverse perspectives attempting to answer the question and i'll come back to that in my conclusion because on, on the face of it a stricter lockdown will save more lives from covid but also harm more livelihoods so there's a very obvious on the face of it trade-off but of course as some people have argued that if that actually less severe lockdowns might cause more harm to livelihoods as well, because you've got this ongoing fear, uncertainty, lack of confidence, um, and indeed people taking time off sick. So we never know what the counterfactuals are um, for that trade-off, even we don't know what they are within each of those elements on their own, even if we took lives, right? We wouldn't know who might otherwise have died and when. Um, if we were to look at livelihoods on their own, we wouldn't know who might otherwise lose their jobs and when. Um, it's a very difficult problem. And that led the government when it was out, when it set out its tiering structure on the 30th of November to say, it's not possible. This is, this is, this is the quote. It's not possible to assess the balance of these effects. Um, and I think that's not acceptable. I don't think it's acceptable to, to not try because what it does, I think, is it, it, it then, kind of reinforces a continued emphasis on COVID deaths. I mean, it's not, you know, all, all we've seen every day since March is COVID deaths. All we've seen every day since the summer is a number of people with COVID. What we haven't seen is any evidence on anything else at any time. And I think that what we are now in is probably the worst case of situational blindness that I think we've ever seen. I think we know this is a very clearly well-established psycho psychological phenomenon that you're paying attention to something because it's important because you're paying attention to it. But what you can do is it can abstract you from looking at the bigger picture, taking you away from seeing what really matters. And in, in areas where situational blindness has been most pronounced in the airline industry, in surgical operating theatres, 
they had very simple checklists, right? You know, pilots would be taking off, planes would take off, and they wouldn't have co-pilots sitting next to them because they checked whether the instruments were working and forgot something that was fundamentally important. So in the very least, I think we should be having checklists. We should have a set of criteria that are the most fundamentally important things that any policy decision, pandemic or otherwise, should pay attention to. Now, trained as an economist, of course, I'd like to see this expressed in a full bone cost benefit, but I appreciate that that's not always possible, particularly at a time of crisis. So, so what we might instead do is pay attention to a limited subset of outcomes of interest. Let's say life years lost. That seems to be something that seems to be important. That's, we, we, we obviously care about people dying prematurely. We care about who dies and we care about when they die. So this is potentially where less severe lockdowns might have saved more lives, not from COVID, but from other causes. Um, we shut the schools. That was... Uh, something that I came out in March and said that, I, that was a disproportionate response to the impact I think that we were having on our children and not just for learning outcomes but particularly for those children who were in school where school was the only safe place that they would get cared for and fed and the government messaging which was absolutely true stay at home was a very powerful message but it provoked a disproportionate fear because people were taking their kids out of school long before long before lockdown so it wasn't just a lockdown measure this was a this was a kind of a, a sort of messaging a, a kind of narrative really that we that we made around the covid now again really really hard to estimate there's been some estimates done in the states trying to look at the life years lost from kids being not in um, infant schools and you know that that evidence is is very hard to to, to you know, estimate, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't try. And so we also know, for example, that if we take account of the fact that people did stay at home and didn't go into hospitals when they had you know, serious illnesses, that probably the life years lost now from cancer um, will probably exceed those lost from COVID. Um, we know loneliness um, has actually similar effects on people's life expectancy as when you smoke. Um, we know that unemployment and stress causes people to die sooner. It's not beyond the realms of policy to consider these effects when making a decision. Now, it might be that we decided to do exactly the same things. I doubt it, but we might have done. We might have acted in exactly the same ways, but we would be doing it armed with at least an assessment of what the evidence would look like if only we were to um, have it. And... I think it's important to say, of course, I'm just focusing on life years. We know, I do a lot of work on, you know, um, people's happiness and well-being. Of course, the people care about life experiences and not just life expectancy. We also care about liberties. Um, and I think that they've been sort of parked to one side, almost not had any attention focused on them at all, um, as, we've, as we've, you know, kind of focused almost exclusively on the mortality risk from COVID. So, so I think as we move forwards... What, what, this re what this really reinforces is we need a diversity of perspective in decision making. I think that, that, you know, had there been people around the decision making table in March and April when the schools were closing, who were alert to the impact that vulnerable children might, might have when, you know, they shut schools and we still decided to close schools, I would have had more confidence in that decision. I'd had more, I would have had more faith in it because... You know, if you think about it, like I'm 52, so take my age, plus or minus five, five years, that's probably pretty much 90% of, the, the, of, of those advising and making these kinds of you know, choices. Um, it's a particular age group. Um, it's a particular class. I mean, Sinetra, I think, drew attention to working class people. We're entirely middle class people making these kinds of decisions, all of whom, I think probably without exception can work from home on full on full pay um, I think that's that's important because the nature of these trade-offs then become it's impossible for us to look at any policy decision without our own lens uh, we can abstract ourselves from data but we but we can't avoid putting ourselves in there so if ourselves are going to be in there then we need lots of different selves in forming decision making we need people for whom the trade-offs between the costs and benefits of different policies, are entirely different, so that you then can form a decision informed by different perspectives. I think that's what's, that's what's really fundamentally important. And I'll just conclude, because you drew attention to the duck-rabbit problem. And 
Of course, once you see that image in a particular way, it's really difficult to not see it as a duck. And it, the more the evidence might present itself that is in fact a complex combination, which pretty much every issue is, the harder it is for you to see it once you've picked a side. And I think that what happened when we, we may have faced that kind of system threat that we felt we had in March and April is that many people picked a side and it's now almost impossible for them to see the other side. And I think that that's why we're, that's part of the reason why we are where we are now. It's not too late for us. And as we move forward, that I think we should be ensuring again, just to finish, that we have a diverse range of different perspectives and backgrounds making the decisions. Thank you. That's great, thank you. Incredibly rich um, set of comments and, and presentations from you all. Thank you so much. And we've got a lot of questions which are, which are coming in, as you can imagine, uh, through the chat. And we also, so I'm just going to, um, to ask you to, and not everybody has to answer each one of these, uh, so, but um, just sort of indicate to me if you're if we're prepared to take it as it were. Um, and a few of them are around the differential impacts of the disease, uh, and particularly its impacts on frontline workers, the poor and ethnic minorities in the UK. Um, and the question then being asked, should they take the hit for the economy from Sajenda Sagu with a few people um, sort of backing that question? thoughts around how do we manage the disproportionate impacts that, that we know this disease has on, on particular uh, on particular classes of people or particular people themselves and again um, perhaps to think of this not just in the past but as we roll forward and perhaps as we roll forward with the with a with a vaccine and, and thinking about I suppose a prioritization as to uh, who we should be protecting first with that with that vaccine, thinking about the, what we know now about distribution of the impacts of COVID. You'd like to take that one first? Yeah, I'm. Oh. Uh, yeah, look, I think it's a, it's a very helpful question, uh, and I think um, the worst affected population. I, 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 last time I looked, it was the Bengali population. And they have doubled the risk of mortality compared to white British people. And also, they have the highest uh, multi-occupational households. I think there are around about 30% of Bengali population lives in multi-occupancy household, where you've got multi-generational living. So I think there are really serious questions to be asked about society and how we want to structure society, yeah. our urban centres, and our cities. So I think that's an incredibly important question. And I think going out of this, what we can't do is, is let the ball drop, if you like. We suddenly get a vaccine and say we're all back to normal and then we move on. We've got to address these issues. From a frontline perspective, um, I, I, on the weekends, I'm an urgent care GP myself and actually as a frontline worker and got COVID on March the 15th, 16th. And, and, and going back to that time, I, I, uh, when I reflect on it, I reflect on how unprepared we were. Hmm. And the reason I think we had to go in lockdown in the first reason was because we had a new pathogen and it was emerging that we had a complete lack of preparedness. We just did not have any personal protective equipment. We had one set in urgent care and it had gone hmm. the night before. And so we went in as accepting that we were wholly unprepared. Once we get the preparation in place, and this is around transmission, this is not just the preparation is, I think as we heard earlier, just about influenza, we've got a vaccine. We need to understand the features around transmission that we can slow down this virus, we can protect ourselves. Once we've got them in place, that should allow us to say, we don't need to have such a drastic lockdown in the future. And I think that's imperative. So we learn that lesson going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Other other thoughts on this in terms of the the different vulnerable populations, Sally. Well, I think you're still on mute, Sally. I am. I got there. there you go. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, what I thought that was all fascinating, and what this question uncovers is. As Carl put it, we didn't know what this virus was, how it worked, its impact, and how it was going to go forwards. And we weren't prepared, and I talked about lack of resilience. And 
I think we weren't prepared because we weren't able to test people. Uh, I'm sure you all know people who caught it and stayed at home and got quite ill, but couldn't get a test, so they didn't know they'd got it. No. If you look at Germany, where their results were pretty good, people uh, had out-of-hospital care. They were diagnosed with a test. They were offered oxy oximeters, and if their oxygen saturation dropped off, they were carted off to hospital pretty quick, and they got better outcomes. So I think we were totally unprepared, and I don't think we've caught up yet on that out-of-hospital care we're getting the testing there, but you have to go to the test centre, which if you're pretty sick, you can't. And um, we've ordered the oximeters, but I'm not aware that they've been deployed around the place. And we need to think through the different elements of what people are, are needing and how we can improve our response. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we'll be able to move forward by saying to the Bengali population, you must live... Um, more spread out in, in more multiple houses. This is their community and how they do it. But how can we treat those who get it and prevent tr transmission and what's the role of testing become very important in, the, in these discussions? Thank you. Thank you. And um, Shanitra, just um, as well, a particular question has come in to you to, to ask you to explain a little bit more about your thoughts on, on immunity levels. And again, going to the issue of the differential impact uh, or susceptibility of people to COVID uh, and linking that with the uh, other preventative measures that we can put in place, be that testing or, or vaccine. So just, just to, people have asked about your, your thoughts and your, your data really on immunity levels within the population and how that might play into the decisions we make going forward about how to manage COVID. Okay, just, just first to answer, the, uh, just to address one point that was made about should the Bengali population, or, well, I'm Bengali myself, actually, but um, the, the, the whole multi-generational households here uh, has, uh, actually, it's a stand-in for people who are poor in this context. I mean, it's true that in Calcutta, where I come from, you, often your grandmother does live with you, but the, the what what is missing from this is the recognition that these households are not just multi-generational. They are living in a situation where they cannot possibly isolate the grandmother. So we're talking about people who are, um, who are disadvantaged at a serious level. And lockdowns, what, what's very problematic here is that when you say you can't, how do you protect multi-generational households? through shielding, um, what you're not recognizing is that the alternative is to go into, apparently to go into lockdown. And lockdowns, as has already been shown, have a profound effect on these populations, not just in terms of what it will do in terms of livelihoods and, and their ability to, to, to survive uh, on other fronts, but also just in terms of exposure to COVID. Many of these, um, the people who live in these households who do have comorbidities were forced to go out and and, and continue to, to be um, essential workers who are out there getting sick and dying. So, you know, we have to be very clear um, what Paul, in, in what we're saying when we trot out these, sort of, should they take the hit for the economy? In fact, they take the hit, lockdowns, are a real hit on these communities. And, uh, you know, as Paul said, you have to keep in mind, it's not enough. And, and maybe you, people aren't capable, don't have that negative capability or whatever it is, but then we need the multiple voices if we ourselves can't place ourselves in these households. In terms of immunity, where are we at? We don't know, that's exactly what I'm saying. That's why it astonishes me that people just say, well, of course we are all non-immune or we, we um, because we don't know for a number of reasons. One is because we don't really have the tests that would tell us what proportion have already been exposed. Um, we also don't know to what extent previous exposure to other coronaviruses protect us against disease. What we do see is an age pattern of disease that is consistent with the idea that there is a lot of protection from previous 
exposure to other seasonal coronaviruses. So we don't know what, what that is, but what we do know it from the other coronaviruses is if you do build up immunity and maintain it, whether it's through some sort of dynamical process of reinfection or because people remain immune for a long period, that that creates, that lowers the risk of infection to those vulnerable to the point that we now accept, as I said, um, for other coronaviruses. And we can head there. That, so that should be our destination. But what vaccines will do is allow us not just to get to that destination, but to, in synergy with naturally acquired immunity, create a, a wall of protection against for the vulnerable. So we need to use the vaccines and naturally acquired immunity in a synergistic way to, to strengthen that wall. Excellent, thank you. David, you wanted to come in. Yeah. So just a quick observation about immunity. So if in the UK we'd had the levels of immunity that Sunitra proposed we had back in May, we wouldn't have seen a second wave recognizing that the second wave is happening on the back of all of the um, behavioral changes that people have put in place in their own lives in addition to the government interventions. So it, it isn't really supportable to say that we have the sort of immunity in the population that would make a discernible difference to uh, COVID transmission right now. Uh, even if, in theory, the fact that we're doing antibody tests rather than T-cell tests means that we're somewhat underestimating the proportion of people who've seen the disease and are immune. I get a quick note on shielding. Yeah. So shielding makes eminent sense if uh, a few things obtain. First is we have a competent policy response, and arguably uh, we haven't seen much evidence of competence. Um, second, if we had uh, broadly available testing uh, as needed, so uh, people could identify uh, when they're potentially infectious and take themselves out of the uh, uh, exposure of others, difficult though that is in a poor multi-general generation household. Uh, third, uh, nobody is going to do that. We've seen the numbers that only 20% of people who know they're positive actually do the right thing because we haven't provided income support. We haven't provided uh, quarantine hotels. We haven't provided the means to uh, adequately shield. And thirdly, we've got asymptomatic infections, which are always going to mean that uh, people will be coming into contact with older people and not knowing it. So shielding can only work if we have a uh, thoroughly competent public health system that is able to do a lot of things that we cannot put in place because we don't have that level of competence. And as Carl pointed out, the fact that with everything we know and everything we've done, the fact that the care homes uh, are now uh, seeing a modest second wave shows that we're just not capable of shielding the vulnerable. So I think that takes us to uh, Sunita, and I realise you want to come back, but I've, I've got a lot of questions that are coming in from, uh, from people and we're only really just uh, scratching the surface of some of these. Um, but, but even though of the questions, just because it is such a, um, everybody's, it's affecting everybody's lives in so many direct ways. And a question, um, which obviously hits our, our student community uh, and that generation particularly hard is, um, and this is from Orla Hilton, though there are uh, lots of likes to this particular question is, for a young person like myself, will it prove worth it to undergo such extensive lockdown periods to shield the elderly who are likely not to be contributing to the economy already and likely to contribute little in the future? Will long, young people come to resent the measures imposed due to their long-term ed economic, educational, social effects? And I think what we have there is an issue about, well, is about, I suppose, around attitudes about, um, and therefore it does then go to have an effect on, on behaviors and, and compliance with different policy measures. And so, so Paul, perhaps you would like to take that one. But you're on mute. <laughs> that is the phrase of 2020. 
Okay. It was just fantastic what I just said. I'll have to say it again. Uh, so, no, so, I mean, we've seen four decades of growth be appropriated by the older generation. Um, we've seen the policy responses to COVID magnify intergenerational transfers. That's, 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 that's essentially, I mean, let's just lay out a couple of facts. I mean, we can think about what the, what the ethical solutions to these are, but a couple of facts. If you're currently an 18 year old, you've got probably about a, I don't know, one in three, one in four chance of, well, obviously that would depend on your gender, but, but about a one in, a, a one in three, maybe a bit more chance of living to live as long as the average age of a COVID death. So we're asking, we're asking people to make significant sacrifices for people that they can't expect to live as long as. Now, that may be that we decide that that's ethically acceptable and that's the right thing to do, but we should in the very least be having a conversation about this. Because if we care about inequalities, if we care about inequalities, presumably we care about them over the lifetime not just at any one snapshot in time, because you could take a moment and you could look at something and it just looks, you know, odd or good or bad, but you want to take a full lifetime perspective. And if we do that, there's a very compelling ethical justification for giving greater priority, all else equal to younger over older people, not just because they have more to gain into the future. That's a utilitarian argument but on the basis of a fair innings argument, on the basis of having not yet lived as long. And actually, when we do, I used to do a lot of this work when I you know, worked in health economics back in the day, when we ask citizen preferences around distributional considerations of this kind, like whether to give greater priority to younger or older people, we get a very consistent message coming across, is that we wish to give greater priority to younger over older people, partly because if they had more to gain in the future, but mostly because they haven't yet had as much. And it, it's interesting to me that in the discussion of COVID, and also, by the way, I should say that we're actually gathering data now on these kinds of questions. And um, I don't want to say too much about it too soon because we haven't really looked at, looked at them, but it looks as if people are saying similar things back to us now, even in a pandemic. And especially older people. This is why I, this is why I drew attention earlier to the age range of the decision makers, because wouldn't it be at least interesting to find out more directly what older people would like to happen and, to, and for that to feed more directly into some of what we do. Cause it's, again, it's been, it seems to me, maybe, maybe all this is happening, you know, and, and, and we're not, we're not hearing about it, but it, it seems odd to me that there hasn't been a discussion that's being informed by the generations, by 18 year olds and 80 year olds. What do they actually think we ought to be doing? Why is it being left to middle-aged middle-class 50 year olds who can work from home, who, who by and large have an emphasis on health. This is a health, economic and social crisis. We in the, very, in the very least need an economic and social response, but it's been the health professionals in some large extent that have been situationally blind to what else is going on. And this ethical consideration of the intergenerational transfer is at least worthy of a conversation, at least worthy of, a, of, of, of us speaking to much more than we've heard throughout the last nine months. And I think that raises some important points. And one of the very, it links to, and again, to a very a common question which is coming in uh, to the chat, uh, which are variants of the same theme, which is there seems to be a, a mono voice in the debate, um, which is being driven from a single perspective. And, and why has that been the case and it's as we roll forward remember it's not really now it's about learning lessons from the past in order to deal with the very present and the very very near future uh do we need to change the architecture of that debate uh in some way and if so and if so how sally could i turn to you um given you you had a previous position as as a chief medical officer here so you have been party to debates like this in different different with different hats on in different parts of your life so so I agree with Paul in a, in a big way. I think there's massive intergenerational transfer going on without it being exposed and debated. And one of the things I spend a lot of time on is, of course, antimicrobial resistance. That's another intergenerational transfer. We've used the antibiotics. And I, I th the other issue I feel is that we, we haven't sorted out all the inequalities and what's going on and said, all right, we're going to do something about it. 
So we know, uh, apart from age, one of the next biggest, um, again, an Oxford study, Open Safely, uh, issues um, is obesity and weight-related illnesses. So what we need is a good response to that, to help people, um, help their children, even if it's too late for them, which it shouldn't be, but to help them grow up healthy, um, grow up a normal weight. But that seems to be as if everyone's so focused on the present that they can't think about that. And yet it's going to be key. In fact, we've thought about this and just, I'll do a plug, published a book last week, Whose Health Is It Anyway? about all of these issues and how we need to refinance and redo the public's health. Because it isn't just catching the virus that's the problem and the age, it's how well were you before you got it, and that relates to inequalities and its social drivers and its commercial drivers. And we could do something about the commercial drivers in particular. Excellent. So we are just up against time, but a couple of final, I'll allow each one of you a very, very final thought, uh, briefly as I may, as to how we, how we take forward the debate about the continued managed of, management of COVID and what you would most like to see change in the way that we manage that debate. Shanitra, over to you very briefly. Well, um, you know, it's just to reiterate what everyone's been saying. Uh, which is that we have to look at it from every perspective. I mean, it's just been this monocular vision on, on COVID. And obviously, and I put up that Aristotelian triangle of ethos, pathos and logos, which I find quite useful. And I've been, you know, have mainly directing my attention to the logos and would have preferred to keep it that way, really. But even there, there's so many problems. I mean, we haven't even had a proper debate there. Because, I mean, what I was good raising my hand to say was that it's simply not true that the, what this current epidemic means that there was no herd immunity or herd immunity is not achievable. That's just not true. So we haven't even resolved those basic scientific issues. But what we really must do, and that what I woke it went in March, what I woke up with was the image that Paul actually discussed of the child who gets their only good meal at school. And really, I think that should be paramount in our thinking. But we can only have that debate if we have multiple voices or at least people capable of adopting multiple perspectives. But that's got to be where we go. Thank you. Carl, David, anything to, anything to add to that? Yeah, I guess, I guess what... What's needed now is to depoliticize lots of the issues. We need to be able to ask questions and reflect the uncertainties. And I have so many questions and issues when people speak that I, it's hard to fit into 60 seconds, but very simple questions. We've had about 10 epidemics in the last century. At some point, they've all become seasonal. So they transition from an epidemic, the proportion of population immunity that allows it to become seasonal. At what level does that look like? What numbers of people have to have the infection for that to occur? Sally's point's really incredibly important that this is a disease that disproportionately affects people who are not fit for infections. Non-communicable diseases, obesity. So when we look at the numbers in America, which are stark, you start to understand the problems you accrue if 40% of your population is morbidly obese. You are going into a nightmare scenario. I think that's important. Then my final point is to say, think about what lockdowns don't take care of. As I've said, they don't sort the care home problem out. They don't sort the health healthcare associated infection problem, which is 60% of the burden of what's happening. So if we have to think differently, because lockdowns are not going to sort all of those issues. Thank you. David, final, final thought, very quickly. Very quickly. Um, you know, I think how we got here is because the politicians just can't handle the headline, granny or grandpa can't get a hospital bed, they can't get the uh, treatment they deserve at their age. And so this comes back to building more resilience into the system, having more surge capacity, because if we had that surge capacity, and, and that's not just a matter of hospital beds, it's a matter of the personnel to staff the beds. If we had that, then 
uh, a lot of these extreme steps would not have been necessary. Um, along with this, we've got to improve uh, equity on so many different levels and also have a decentralized public health system that's adequately financed so we get local response to local events. And if we did all of those things, um, we wouldn't have needed the second lockdown and we won't need the third, but uh, that's probably what we're gonna get in January, February, again, so we don't get the ICUs overwhelmed. Thank you, Paul. Muted. Two words, diversity and checklists. Excellent. <laughs> thank you so much, everybody. And uh, thank you so much to everybody who's been listening and sending in your questions. I realize we have only been able to handle a fraction of those, um, but we are so glad that you managed to join us today. Oh, the event will be uh, broadcast on our podcast series uh, where you'll be able to find it. There's some web details there. And also to give a plug for our, the LSE and the Lancet are also running a commission on the future of the NHS, which should be reporting quite soon. So uh, to give a little plug from us all there. Thank you very much for all of you for joining us and uh, take care. We hope to see you at our next event. And thank you so much to my panelists. Goodbye. <laughs>